Hello everybody, it's David Knight and welcome to the OK Boomer Show and this is episode 7 with Mr. John McLean and his book about change and we also have another guest that I'd like to introduce. So firstly, let's introduce John McLean. Hey John. Hey Dave. All the way in Sydney. So I'm here in Denver, John's in Sydney and we're, we're so privileged to welcome Lou Friedland from Florida. Hey Lou. Hello Dave, hello John. Lou, hey, where... Lou. Whereabouts in Florida are you? Are you in Tampa or Clearwater or where are you? We're in Dunedin, Florida, just a little north of Clearwater. Awesome. So uh, we invited Lou to the show because uh, Lou is a very uh, special friend of John and myself. He was the former CEO of Ironman Triathlon. And I think you've heard abundant stories uh, from John and I about Ironman and how that had a deep impact on our lives. And so, Lou, uh, this is all about telling some stories, and you've probably got some about John. You, I know you have none about me, so that'll be good not to share any of those stories. Um, but, uh, Lou, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, David. I'm looking forward to doing this. Yeah, it's been great getting John on the, on the call, and, uh, you know, the three of us have known each other 20-plus years. Um, and so the purpose of this is to tell some stories and bring it back to the book, uh, the five M's of change and uh, tell, tell some good insights that I think will help everybody listening in about tackling some some things out there, some change, um, you know, the pandemic that's out there and just basically inspire you guys to do better things and feel good about yourself. So that's what it's all about. So, John, well, I'd, I'd like to start. Go ahead. I'd like to start by just giving a little bit of history of um, – uh, how I met John and um, why John wound up at, with the Iron Man and uh, uh, how significant the change was that uh, uh, John created for not only himself but so many other people. Awesome. Uh, so um, uh, we, um, a group of us, uh, got involved with the Iron Man in 1989 and um, um, Iron Man was a, a small event. There were four of them around the world. There were about 10,000 people all over the world that had attempted it. And, and um, uh, when we acquired it and started operating it, uh, we wanted to grow the, you know, the opportunities for people to uh, be able to participate in Iron Man races. Um, ABC Wide World of Sports used to do a show every year on it. And, we decided that we wanted to control a little more of it, so we went to NBC and and actually bought two hours of showtime every year um, to allow us to really completely tell the story of Iron Man. And um, a very big piece of that was to get um, people that were just not the world's greatest athletes, um, but also people that had um, challenges that wanted to challenge themselves to, you know, climb uh, Mount Everest without uh, having to do something quite that dangerous. And completing an Ironman was one of those kind of things that people viewed as being something that was superhuman and very difficult to do. Uh, reminding you, it's a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike ride, and then a 26 mile marathon. Uh, all in a period of 17 hours or less. Um, and so as we got into the NBC show, um, we had a lot of human interest stories. We always told the story of the pros and how they won the race and got through in eight or nine hours and uh, um, men and women. Uh, but then we also had stories about people that um, had sacrificed an awful lot to get to the race and and either had physical difficulties or other difficulties in their life. Uh, um, and uh, that was always the theme of the, of the TV shows. And if you went back and asked people, what did you like about the NBC show in 1993? They couldn't tell you who won the race, but they could tell you about the lady who had cancer and had a couple of children and didn't think she was going to survive and got better and eventually trained and crossed the finish line in Iron Man and and those were all the, those kind of stories and um, we got to the point where you know there were things that 
uh, myself and a couple of the other guys wanted to do there. And one of them was to see if we could find people that had physical disabilities uh, or physical challenges that um, uh, might be able to do the race. And uh, there had been one man um, who had done the race in, in 1989, who was a single amputee uh, that had a lot of claim, but we never had gotten somebody that was a wheelchair racer. Um, there was a lot of conversation about whether there was enough safety on the race course to put some crazy guy on a wheelchair in the middle of 2000 bicycles and uh, uh, whether he would be safe and whether it would be safe for other people. And, and uh, we made an attempt uh, one time before John uh, with an athlete who uh, wasn't quite successful doing it. And uh, the next year, John called and said, um, uh, you know, he wanted to try this thing. And, and we really were eager to actually have somebody try this. And But the rule was you had to use the same times as the able-bodied people. You couldn't. You didn't get extra time in the swim or you didn't get extra time, you know, on the bike or the, or the run. Um, you had to do all those things within the same time periods. There were no, you know, whatever your limitations were, you had to overcome those to do it. And, um, you know, it took John a few times to get all the way through it, doing all of those things. But once he did, he changed the view of Iron Man for so many people um, and uh, it was just a phenomenal uh, opportunity for us to have somebody like John come into our lives and, and prove to us that uh, uh, what we always used to call anything is possible. Yeah, I think that's such a powerful story, Lou, and thanks for sharing the background there. Um, it's funny that John wasn't even allowed to do the Ironman Australia because of the potential danger. <laughs> supposedly, right, of crossing the bridge. Um, but yeah, Ironman to me is truly life-changing, right? Whether you're an enabled athlete, a pro, or, or a challenged wheelchair racer like John. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really special what you did for John and what you did for me. I mean, I, I think it's truly, if anybody hasn't stretched themselves um, to do something amazing or just challenging, something that keeps you up at night and gets you out of bed in the morning to go and train, um, John and I have talked a lot about that through this little latest journey. But uh, Lou, what was your first impression of John? And we can share stories about that. How's that? Well, you know, John was a young man back then, and um, um, he was full of what I would call piss and vinegar. He was uh, absolutely determined to uh, uh, be able to do and complete anything he had on his mind. Um, he had obviously gone through years of, of struggle of trying to figure out how his body was going to be able to react. And, and um, uh, for him to take on what was considered at that time the very toughest of endurance sports um, was was you know something that just about everybody that was uh, around at the time thought was impossible to be to be overcome and um, you know learning about John and and uh, being able to watch him train and do the things he did and then show up in Kona and um, uh, you know, just put on a, a fantastic race, even the first time he raced. Um, uh, although it didn't make all the cutoffs that first time, it was uh, uh, it was just a brilliant performance. And what we knew then was that there was a human being capable of putting going through this event, um, you know, and in a, on a wheelchair. And, uh, and John proved that he could do it just a matter of time when he got all the all the pieces clicking together in the right place yeah he certainly started that uh that wheelchair category right in iron man and <clears throat> the the year he was successful you know he had to race against a couple of up-and-coming wheelchair athletes and uh you know he he overcame a lot of of uh adversity and the usual winds of kona right and uh john's talked about the technology advantages of just doing it a couple of times and taking some weight and some profile out of that bike because you don't want to be in a wheelchair using your arms in a headwind, John. How, how hard was that coming back from uh, the 
bike turnaround at Harvey when the wind changed just to really screw with you, screw with your mind and your body. Yeah, well, I think, Luth, I really value your time today because, you know, you were a part of really changing the course of Ironman for, you know, physically challenged athletes. So thank you for allowing the door to be open to, as you know, help many more uh, since then. So I think back to your question, Dave, I mean, I enjoyed swimming. That's something I really like to do. But getting on that hand cycle and using your arms as opposed to your legs, and as Luke mentioned, 112 miles or 180 kilometres in Australian terms, it's, it's a long way to go without doing a, a swim beforehand, 3.8 kilometres. So I was so excited to be a part of that whole experience. And, you know, you get caught up in it. So here's NBC, Lou, as you mentioned, and, you know, asking me questions as I'm going, and it was just like a whole lot of fun until the winds turned, and then it wasn't any fun. So I went from thinking, I, I kind of got this every 10 kilometres or six miles, you're encouraged, as you know, by the, the aid stations and the support groups, and then you're exposed to the elements, and the elements in, uh, in China on the Big Island can really, you know, play with you, and it did for me. So it changed my, uh, my, my mind thinking, well, I've got to keep on going here. You're encouraged to keep on moving towards the next aid station. But when that wind hits you up to, you know, a, a lot, I'm not going to say, you know, it was blowing people off bikes. So there's an indication that it was rough. It starts to play with your mind. And you know what, I made the turnaround. And unfortunately, the, the trade winds in, in Hawaii and other parts of the world actually turn around back on you. So I was, uh, it was a double whammy on the way there, headwind, and on the way back, headwind. So David really started to play with my mind. And uh, there were times where I thought, this is all too hard. But I wanted to keep on going to see myself as equal and to inspire kids. So, um, Lou, you're right. It's a, it's a tough day in the office. So, Lou, I, I, you know, I, I, David, let me uh, just add just a little something to that. You know, people ask me over the years about how tough it is to do an Ironman. And um, there's actually two completely separate races. The pros who are out there uh, get out of their swim in less than an hour, get on their bike, get to Javi, make the turn, and are about three quarters of the way back before noon. And the winds haven't started yet. Where the age group racers like John and, and people like yourself um, take a, an extra half hour in the swim, take an extra you know, 45 minutes or so or hour in the bike. Or two. And the winds, or two, or three. <laughs> and um, um, it's a completely different race. The race for an amateur athlete in Hawaii, it's substantially more difficult to accomplish than it actually is for the pros because of the way the elements are, the heat. Um, you get extraordinary heat on that black tar uh, and in the lava fields in the middle of the afternoon, and the pros are already taking a shower and back to, you know, back done for the day, and uh, um, and you're you're still beating yourself up with the heat. So and so here wind. here's an idea, Lou. Why don't you start the pros like three hours after the the age groupers start, right, and have them, you know, suffer. You actually had that conversation <laughs> more than once. <laughs> None I'm of sure. the pros didn't show that. So Lou, uh, as John said, I mean, uh, I think attributed to you and the team, I mean, you scaled Ironman from like four races to a global phenomenon. And uh, part of this conversation is about mapping, you know, back to business, right? So um, when you think about change and you think about business change, which you dramatically impacted that business change and tying it back to the five M's. Like, how did you go from like four races and a, and a, and, and, and the history of Iron Man again, it's probably worth talking about, you know, like four or five military guys on the isle, on the island of Hawaii decided to have a, a testosterone event to see, you know, is a Marine versus Air Force versus Army versus Navy, you know, who's the fittest guy on the island, right? Tell, tell that story. And then let's go to like, Lou, tell us some of the secrets and what you use to actually grow that business so successfully. Okay, well, let me let me start with the uh, the originators. Uh, uh, the story goes, and the story has changed many times over the years, uh, but the story, as I heard it originally, which I think is accurate, was that uh, there are two um, uh, there's two guys in in a bar in Hawaii. One's a Navy SEAL, and and one's a ranger, and um, uh, one of them is a great cyclist and the other is a great runner. 
and the two of them trying to figure out which one was the better athlete. And they decided that they would um, um, try to do something each each of their disciplines, but also we had a swim to it. So um, there were three events on the uh, on on uh, uh, in Honolulu. One was the uh, Honolulu Rough Water Swim, which was a 2.4 mile swim, and you just happen to get out of the water right where the around the island boat bike race was. Um, and if you stopped at 112 miles on the bike race, that was the beginning of the Honolulu Marathon. So they took the rough water swim, the bike ride around Hawaii, and then the Honolulu Marathon and did all three, convinced 15 guys to try it, 12 of them finished it. And um, they were, you know, it's, and uh, the, the award was uh, that you gave them $5 and there was a lady named Valerie Silk who eventually became one of the race directors um, and Valerie Silk uh, made t-shirts um, uh, and you got a t-shirt if you uh, if you finished. That's awesome. And, um, what year, what year what year would this have been, Lou? When was how far back? In in 1978. Okay. 1978. Yeah. And what so, uh, um, Commander now, Col Commander Collins was he one of the guys or we, 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 I yeah, know John, met, Collins John Collins John Collins and um, um, I've forgotten the name of the other guy. I'll think of it in just a minute. Um, but they um, they did they ran the race. John wound up getting um, transferred to Panama, and the lady Valerie Silk, who was the uh, bookkeeper at the Nautilus Center over there, he said to her, "Why don't you keep running this race? Maybe you can have some fun with these guys." And um, for a couple more years, they did, and. Um, uh, one year, um, uh, Wide World of Sports was actually on the island shooting a surfing contest, and uh, there wasn't good surf that day. And somebody said, "You should go see these guys um, do this crazy event." And they filmed a little bit of it. Uh, wound up with the uh, winner on the Johnny Carson show, and and all of a sudden, several hundred people contacted Valerie and said they want to do the race. And she eventually had to move it to the big island of Kona because they didn't want something that disruptive, uh, uh, you know, in, in Honolulu. So uh, that was 1981. And then um, uh, from 81 to 88, uh, Valerie Silk ran the race. And then we bought it from her in 1989. Wow. What a story. Um, and so, Lou, what was the, what was the, inside secret to growing that business i know you're an accomplished business guy and and but but how did you actually take it from what was obviously a an idea that people were resonating towards it was like a self-challenge how did you how did you actually make that a global phenomenon today i mean iron man is just it's everywhere right yeah it is everywhere now and and uh, there there was you know it was actually very simple it was that um um, what we needed to do was get people convinced that the average man with a year of training and uh, a decent physical capability could accomplish doing an Ironman. And um, uh, they, they'd seen it on TV. They had done those kind of things. Uh, but there were no races in the United States at all. Um, it, there was the psychology of... Uh, uh, keeping Kona as the only race in the United States didn't make a lot of sense to me, but it did to uh, the people that was operating it before us. So, so um, when I took over, um, I called uh, uh, the guy who was running Ironman Canada, a guy named Graham Fraser, and I said, I'd like to run a race in the United States. Go find me a place and let's see if anybody will show up. So um, he called me one day and said, I, I found the spot. I want to go to Lake Placid, New York, and uh, let's see what we can do. We had a little press conference in Lake Placid, uh, picked the third week of July of the next year. And Graham said, gee, if, if we do this, will we get anybody to come? And so after the press conference, we opened up a registration um, and we put 2,000 slots in it. And, um, within about six hours, there were 2,000 people from all over the world that wanted to come to Lake Placid, New York a year later. And um, uh, 
uh, try to become an accomplished Ironman. Um, that worked so well, we went down to uh, Florida, to Panama City. Uh, we wound up in Madison, Wisconsin. We wound up in, uh, uh, then my biggest challenge was I wanted to do one in California because California was the, uh, the home of triathlon before Ironman. And um, uh, we spent about a year trying to convince the uh, military base at Camp Pendleton that that was the perfect location to do an Ironman event. Um, and we did the first Ironman in California that year. It was an incredibly successful race. Um, once we had those, those races, we then could go to ESPN and buy an ESPN sports package. So we had eight programs of Ironman on ESPN every year, which again showed people that there were a lot of average people that did something extraordinary and could do something extraordinary. And the demand continued to grow. Um, over the seven years I was president, we opened 29 new Ironman races throughout the world. Um, we went to Korea, we went to, we were in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, Malaysia, we were in, uh, we were in Spain, we were in- um, Germany's a big Germany, race too, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, moved some races around there. We went down to South Africa, uh, went there um, and uh, had a couple of races in uh, South America. And, and uh, all of a sudden, people around the world wanted to become an Ironman. And, uh, uh, you know, other than pre-COVID, uh, you know, Ironman was doing almost uh, 150 races a year now. At about 2,000, 1,500, 2,000 in events. So that's a lot of people. Well, they, yeah, they actually have, they've, they've done the science a little better and they're actually doing 2,500 and 3,000. And they're also doing, <laughs> in certain places, they're doing Saturdays for men and Sundays for women. And they're putting 5,000 people over there on the race course during a weekend. So, right. And they got 70.3s uh, too now too, right? So half Ironman yeah, as well. And the half Ironmans were, uh, have always been something we added uh, several half iron bands during that time yeah um and uh it, that's also become a favorite for a lot of people because it doesn't beat you up so badly and, and wimps uh, not so difficult to recover yeah wimps i call them wimps, wimps. i gotta take okay. half half a half a uh, half half a tattoo on my leg for the half iron man rather than a full tattoo <laughs> on my leg um so let's talk about uh, Lou, like just fantastic change um, in terms of business trajectory. And obviously, Graham Fraser was a great business partner. So I'm sure there's a people component to it, like having the right team, having the right vision. Uh, but what were some of the other challenges in terms of scaling that business? Were there lots? Well, you know, every, every town and every city you went into is different. So it was a personal, you, you couldn't do it over the phone. Um, you know, I used to tell people that uh, I think there was a commercial on United Airlines one time about uh, the business guys and the boss hands out uh, uh, flight tickets to everybody and says, go see your customers. And um, literally every day I was traveling somewhere in the world to go talk to somebody about what Iron Man could do for their community and what the community could do for Iron Man. And, um, uh, it became partnerships because I could bring 10,000 people to a town uh, for a week that would allow um, uh, uh, allow these people to, to watch their families and friends do Iron Man, and um, it was a uh, a really exciting time. But uh, um, getting permits in towns and you know making sure that people were safe and getting the medical needs that you needed to have and, and all the volunteers know, put, right you needed hundreds of volunteers yeah, to... we, we, we would have a, a thousand volunteers basically at every race so right you'd have a whole community component to it also uh couldn't do it without those people yeah that's awesome so john what what uh what did iron man do for you well iron man literally changed my life because you know i used to watch it as a kid um and then having my accident which was at the time, I thought all those doors had now closed, given you, know, you can't run and you can't 
write a conventional bike and all those kinds of things. And then here I am watching uh, Ironman in 1994 when Greg Welsh won the race, a fellow Australian, and then to see John Franks participate, Lou, who was the first wheelchair athlete to, uh, to take on the course. Um, so for me, that, that was terribly exciting to know that the, uh, the door had been opened uh, to the physical challenge category, and I being one of those. And then again, I started to dream again, as I did as a little boy. And now it's like, well, why can't I take on the toughest endurance event? Why can't I, you know, chase my dreams? Why can't I potentially be the first in the world to, as a butch athlete, to cross the line? And then maybe that'll um, open up doors for others down the track. So that's where Ironman's played a, a huge part in my life, which really got me to think that maybe I could do something with my life because after getting hit by the truck and having a near death experience, I thought all those doors had been closed. So I'm forever grateful for Iron Man. I think the timing was perfect for me where I was with my life at that time, given my accident was in 1988. I watched uh, John Frank's 1994, and now I kind of built myself up to take on the challenge. And uh, Lou, the first challenge for me was Panama City, as you mentioned, uh, a half Iron Man distance. And to get a chance to race there to qualify for Kona 95, uh, I will be forever grateful to you and the rest of the team for allowing me to participate, but also to open those doors for all those uh, wheelchair athletes, uh, physical challenge athletes that have taken on Kona since then. Yeah, I think one of my proudest moments in my life, John, was actually making your induction speech at the Hall of Fame. Um, so, Lou, think of, you know, how did you guys get to the decision? Because that's a pretty exclusive group, right? People that are in the Iron Man Hall of Fame. How did, how did you go through that criteria? And how did you let this Aussie guy in? Well, the, one of the great blessings of being the president of the Iron Man um, was that once a year I got to pick one person out of the 100,000 or so that were participating in Iron Man races. Um, to uh, be inducted into the Ironman Hall of Fame. And um, uh, John's feat, uh, what he accomplished and what it took for him to get it accomplished, I thought was as extraordinary as anything that any of the greatest professional athletes in the world that had done the race uh, uh, accomplished. Uh, John was very deserving of uh, uh, being right in there with uh, the Mark Allens and the uh, Dave Scotts and the all the Newby, Newby Frasers of the world who were uh, considered some of the greatest athletes ever to hit the face of the earth. And I put John right in that category. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's funny. I, I you know, it's uh, as the world would unfold, I'm working for Gatorade. I met John, you got on this Ironman track, and then I found out that I, uh, Gatorade was no longer on the sidelines, right, of Ironman that just didn't make sense to me so you know in the end i think i connected you with the guys at quaker oats in chicago and the rest is history which just meant you and i got connected and there was a gatorade connection and you know i i uh, asked john um that night that i did my first triathlon so I, I think he asked me well what are you doing next and i'm saying okay you've just finished iron man so i tried to be smart and turn around to john and he goes like well I've been the first wheelchair athlete to do Ironman, so now I'm going to be the first wheelchair athlete to swim the English Channel. And I'm like, well, that's great. That's good. And that's a really big goal, right? Because that is the Everest of swimming. Um, so he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to do an Ironman. I just thought that was just like I just did an Olympic, you know, Olympic triathlon. And so then the, the journey was like, how do, how do I get to do an Ironman? And, uh, and I think at the end of the day, it was like a journey, you know, did the Australian one first. And then I think through the Gatorade connection and through John and through you, I was privileged to get over to Hawaii and be part of the Gatorade team over there. Um, but what a, what a special race. I, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's another event in the world where you have that type of community right because it's such a big event you mentioned you know ten thousand people but whichever iron man it is you've got this really interesting intersection of amped up athletes who are there trying to do the hardest thing they've ever kind of signed up for in their life and you've got this community that's just wheeling them across the line i mean just the, the energy there is just there's nothing like it i've never experienced anything like it how, how did you get that magic connection lou well, it, it's there. You, get, you, you can't be at an Ironman finish line and uh, understand what somebody has gone through for the last eight to 17 hours of their lives and not be emotionally tied to, um, uh, 
to their finish uh, at, at the finish line. And, you know, we had a lot of sponsors from all over the world that would come and I would convince them to, you know, fly to Kona, spend a week with us, watch these athletes and then bring themselves and their spouses so, uh, to the finish line at, at uh, uh, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon when the pros finished and at 10 o'clock to midnight when uh, the toughest of the tough finished. And um, I never had a single one of them ever come back to me and said, that didn't change my life. It didn't inspire me. Even if I don't do an Ironman, I'm going to go do something in my life to accomplish something that I thought was not possible before. Yeah, that's so, it's so special. I mean, I, I know now it's, it's, it's pretty well, you know, it's around the world. It's in many, it, it's in many places. Um, and as I said, it, it changed my life. I had the privilege of taking my daughter across the line last summer in Lake Placid, which I've done four times, but again, passing that on to the next generation and, and it just totally changed her life. It was like, it, it makes every day's challenge, right? Just seem obsolete, right? Or something that, you know, you can break down and accomplish where you feel like you almost feel unbeatable once you've finished an Ironman because you've gone through the discipline of, you know, a year's training or in my daughter's case, eight weeks training to go into an Ironman. I didn't tell her all the bad things that could happen to you on the course. But John, tell me, tell uh, me, if, go ahead. If I could just share a little story, it's very similar to that. Um, I have a daughter who is a, uh, a lawyer who she's uh, only about 5'2". She doesn't look like, you know, the greatest athlete in the world. And and uh, as a pleasant surprise, I learned the night before uh, Ironman Florida that she had been training for the previous six months and she was going to do the race. Um, and she's in a big law firm, 90% men, 10% uh, women, and she was one of the junior lawyers there. And, when she crossed the finish line, she went into the office on Monday and she said it was just a complete different acknowledgement of who she was and how people treated her as accomplishing something like that. And she said it completely changed her life or the confidence that she had in herself and the way people respected her in the office. It was a, it was a life changing experience. And that's not a single story. I, I can tell you that it's happened many, many, many times to people. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's somebody that's crossed the line or tried to cross the line that hasn't changed their life in, in multiple ways, right? It just, uh, it's a super connection. And uh, this sounds like an ad for Iron Man, but, um, you know, it's just a super connection of mind and body and, and challenge. And, and again, you know, getting back to the book, you know, to, to get to the... To get to the start line is the biggest journey, right? And you need a lot of planning. You need a lot of capability to kind of change your mindset, change what you're doing to to steal yourself to start start and finish that event. Dave, can I jump There's in just to share? Yep. Sorry, Lou. Um, which I think is kind of relevant to a hospital bed, to the names that Lou was kind enough to mention. I mean, you're talking, uh, we're talking Everest here of, you know, Ironman being the Everest of uh, triathlon, uh, Ironman, and uh, the Everest of channel swimming, you know, is the channel compared to Mount Everest. So here I am in a hospital bed, thinking that, you know, life's really not worth living, uh, really had no direction. And then I see Ironman on television, and I see Greg Walsh, who, you know, a massive fan of who won the race, and again, mentioned uh, John Franks as a woods athlete. And then, you know, Luke creates this opportunity and I'm so excited to explore. And then let's fast forward to, you know, 1997 where I crossed the line. I was so proud to have had the opportunity to represent. I had my Australian flag out and I was representing people around the world with challenges, not just in Australia. Um, and then I get this email from Luke. Uh, John, it gives me great pleasure to uh, let you know that um, I would like to invite you as part of the IMED family uh, into the Hall of Fame, which, you know, you can imagine I've been looking up to uh, Mark Allen, Dave Scott, Paul and Fraser, all the names that Lou had mentioned, Greg Ross being one of those for me, and going like, I just couldn't really get my head around what Lou was inviting me into. And then, you know, I had the opportunity, as you know, Dave, to meet with uh, 
uh, Greg beforehand just to say, I don't know what to say to you because you're kind of my mentor. And this, in my eyes, it should go to you and not to me. And Welsh, you've been a, you know, a great guy saying, now this is your time, grab it. And, you know, today I can say that I'm friends with Mark Allen, I'm friends with Dave Scott. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of meeting Paula and, you know, and again, Greg is a, is a really good mate. So I'm in again, thanks to Lou's opportunity to be invited into that very special club. And I'll never forget, Dave, when you were kind enough to do the uh, speech for me and obviously Alex Hamill, a dear friend, being a part of that as well. Um, how overwhelming that whole uh, experience was. And I, I really felt for the first time, I'm absolutely equal to anyone on the planet. And after my accident, I didn't think that was the case because of, you know, language and uh, the way I felt about, you know, what I would do with my life. And therefore, coming back to the book, right? So, you know, I always had a really clear map or plan around, you know, the, the, the picture is Iron Man. I need to build a team to support that. And the ability to talk myself in or out of the race as it's unfolding, as we've all mentioned, it's a tough day in the office. And I can understand why a lot of people let the negative override the positive and pull out like it's tough. But if we can learn to control the conversations in our mind around our mindset, then that'll keep us going forward. Clearly, I mentioned mentors. There's been plenty of those. Um, the, the the wonderful experiences that just continue to unfold. So, you know, we look at uh, motivation. Clearly, I'd use examples of motivation to get me across the line. Um, momentum, measuring the steps along the way. And, you know, today, Lou, it's so wonderful to sit back and either go fishing with you or have a conversation with you that you literally uh, change the course for a lot of athletes under the physically challenged barrier to take on you know, seemingly the impossible. And as we all know, it does become possible if we follow those principles. So thank you again for allowing me to be the first person to open the doors for, for others. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, we're, we're probably running a bit long, but it's been a great, great conversation. Um, Lou, really appreciate what you've done and just echo, you know, whether that's wheelchair athletes or the average Joe who tries to, you know, get out there on the weekend, call them weekend warriors, right? Like who run and swim and ride a bike and setting them such a goal. And uh, John and I have talked a lot about this. It's like, unless you have a goal, right? Unless you have something that scares you, you know, pretty well, like, <laughs> what's going to get you out of bed when it's raining and what's going to get you on the bike when you need to. Um, so Ironman is one of those things, truly life-changing, uh, changed my life just as you two have changed my life. So appreciate you both. Um, I'm sure we'll get you back on the show, Lou. Just a heads up. I think we're, uh, you mentioned Greg Welsh, his wife, Sean Welsh and uh, Wendy Ingram, the classic crawl to the finish line. What was year was that, Lou? Was that like 90... 196 what would do you remember i, I think it was 97 it was 97 uh, yeah it, it, oh yeah that's right sean that's right sean and wendy were 97 yeah i was thinking of julie right uh julie's oh, crawl was uh early earlier than yeah. 81 yeah so uh hopefully we'll get uh wendy on the show she's a denver resident um but uh yep. she'll, she'll have some fun stories about uh iron man and that's just a classic like uh finish to to a very tough day in the office, like fourth and fifth place, fighting it out, crawling the last hundred meters down the uh, the finish line at uh, at Kona. So, all good. Any last words of advice, Lou, John? I'll let John go Lou. first. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's re it's really important, Dave, to kind of keep on coming back to to your point, having something to look forward to. So, if we don't have something to look forward to. The next day rolls into the next week, rolls into the next year, rolls into a life. So, you know, absolutely have a clear vision of a map or a plan that you want to work toward, which gives you something to look forward to. So, Lou, thank you for giving me something to look forward to with Iron Man. Um, it certainly has changed my life. Yeah, and, and I would say, John, that, uh, uh, David, that, uh, you know, as in business, um, setting goals, being extraordinarily focused, um, not getting distracted um, can get you to the finish line, whether it's uh, in business or uh, on the race course. Awesome. Well, couldn't get better advice from two of my favorite people in the world. Uh, Lou, thank you so much. John, thank you. And uh, for those that are listening and have listened this long, subscribe to the channel, share it, like it, and tune in next week for 
our show ideally with Wendy Ingram or some other surprise guests that we're lining up for John and I. So really appreciate you all. Have a great evening, everybody. Um, and get out, set some goals, do some stuff, change people's lives. Life's short. So let's go do it. Signing out. Okay, Boomer. <laughs>